Good morning. Good morning. Whoa. It's really early in the morning and I did not pay everyone at this front table to applaud. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning and welcome to the Leadership Institute's December Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast with our honored guest, Ken Cuccinelli. My name is Matthew Hurt. I am the Director of Graduate Programs here at the Leadership Institute. We hope that you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving celebration. Happy fourth night of Hanukkah to our Jewish friends. Uh, and Merry Christmas as we head into the season of giving, a uh, season of remembrance, and uh, an opportunity to gather together with friends and loved ones. Uh, and we're glad that you're kicking off December gathering together with us. And so Morton sends his best, uh, is unable to join us this morning. He uh, was in Guatemala for a conservative conference and took a bit of a tumble. He's doing fine, he's doing fine, can still enjoy Popeyes and the occasional Whopper, uh, but he, he sends his best and will be with us again soon. So we thank you uh, for your well wishes and, uh, and for putting him in your thoughts and prayers. We live in interesting times, as Morton would say. NASA tells us there is an asteroid the size of the Eiffel Tower hurtling toward the Earth. But they say, we shouldn't worry. It's on track to pass us by in late December. We should not worry because if it has other characteristics that the French have, it will surely surrender <laughs> before entering Earth's orbit later this month. Additionally, I mean, look, if we have three more years of Joe Biden or an asteroid the size of the Eiffel Tower, I'll let you flip that coin and decide which one. You want, I encourage you to live tweet this event, except for my off-color jokes. You can find us at Leadership Inst there on the screen, and the hashtag we use is WWCB. Uh, engage with us on social media. In fact, I can't encourage you enough if you are on Facebook, Twitter, Telegram, Instagram, wherever it is, uh, share, like, repost the things that we produce and share with you. It is so important for conservatives to occupy that space. Uh, and, uh, and what we've seen in Northern Virginia and across the country when conservatives organize, they win elections and they win for our principles. In 2021, your Leadership Institute has already trained 8,892 conservatives at 366 separate programs. Since 1979, the Leadership Institute has trained 239,000 620 activists, students, and leaders, many of them serving in public policy and the media still today. You have before you allies schedule for the upcoming months, including at least 10 training events in December, both here and online and across the country. Please take a moment to review these schools and consider attending one or sending a friend to a training. If you're watching online, visit our website at leadershipinstitute.org slash training to see upcoming online and in-person trainings. And of course, we have an entire suite of on-demand trainings that you can take at your leisure. Now I'm going to introduce my good friend, David Blom. David is the Campus Reform Correspondent Intern here at the Leadership Institute. David hails from Marshalltown, Iowa, which I'm told is in the middle of that state uh, between Des Moines, Ames, and a handful of other towns. Uh, and is a senior at Bethlehem College and Seminary in Minnesota where he majors in theology and letters. He worked for the Republican National Committee's 2016 Iowa Victory Campaign and served as a clerk to Iowa State Representative Dean Fisher. David, would you come up and provide the invocation and pledge? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please pray with me. My Father and our God, Thank you for bringing everyone here today. Thank you for the food and the hands that prepared it. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to live in a country where we can gather freely, where we can gather to honor and worship you. Um, I pray that you would bless each and every person here through the things we hear from Mr. Cuccinelli. And Lord, I pray that you would help us um, become more effective to love others through our service in the policy process and that we would learn how to win. 
and that we remember our friends, family, and each other during the Christmas and Hanukkah season. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please join me in the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I now turn it over to me for the program's report. <clears throat> In October of this year, Morton established a brand new role here at the Leadership Institute, the Director of Graduate Programs. In that capacity, I have the privilege of connecting allies nearly 240,000 graduates with other trainings, resources, and tools to increase their effectiveness in their communities. To date, I've already spoken to dozens of prospective school board, congressional, and statewide candidates for office, conservative movement leaders, and other activists in communities across the country who are doing the hard work organizing in red towns, in blue counties, and in places in between. I see this role as the switchboard operator for the conservative movement. And I'm excited about the opportunity to increase the effectiveness of LI trained activists. If you or someone you know has taken an LI training at any point in your career, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I will connect you with the resources to be even more effective. And just to give you an idea of the life cycle of a Leadership Institute trained activist. When I was 19 years old, I unsuccessfully ran for local office. I didn't know anything about running. Uh, after that unsuccessful bid, I took a youth leadership school in April of 2007 in Dayton, Tennessee. You may have heard of it. And I still have that notebook today. I use the things that I learned at LI's flagship school, the youth leadership school, uh, to engage in activism across the country and even here in traditionally liberal Arlington, Virginia. Um, I've trained more than 10,000 activists. Uh, across the country and across the globe, and what I've seen is that when trained, when organized, when educated, and when motivated, conservative activists win on our principles. Of course, none of this would be possible without the generous investment of our supporters and donors. Thank you so much for faithfully supporting the organization that launched my career and the careers of thousands of other conservative activists. Thank you, and if you could give our donors a round of applause. And I'm not a donor relations officer, but yesterday was Giving Tuesday, and there's still time to double, triple, or quadruple your match. All right, now I'm going to introduce Avery Selby to introduce our speaker. Avery is from Wingate, North Carolina, is a recent graduate of the University of North Carolina at Charlotte with a degree in health systems management and a minor in economics, hopefully not Keynesian. <laughs> while in college, there are too many of those now. Uh, while in college, Avery was founder and president of her school's chapter of Turning Point USA and an intern for Mark Walker for Senate in North Carolina. She is currently working as the Leadership Institute's studio and video production intern. Uh, Avery, join us and introduce our speaker. Longtime Virginian, Ken Cuccinelli graduated from Gonzaga College High School and went on to earn a BS in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Virginia, a JD degree from George Mason University School of Law, now the Antonin Scalia Law School, and an MA in International Commerce and Policy from George Mason University. In 2002, Cuccinelli entered and won the special election to fill the Virginia State Senate seat in the 37th District. He was re-elected in 2003 and went on to serve a third term in 2007. In 2009, he ran for and was elected as Virginia's Attorney General with 58% of the vote. As Attorney General, Cuccinelli actively defended the Commonwealth against federal government overreach. Such actions included filing the first lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of Obamacare, as well as successfully arguing against the EPA's creative definition of rainwater as pollution 
under the Clean Water Act. In 2013, Cuccinelli ran for governor of Virginia as the Republican nominee, but lost 47 to 45. Throughout his career, he has served on several state commissions, including the Virginia Alcohol Safety Action Project, the Commission on the Prevention of Human Trafficking, and the Virginia Supreme Court Commission on Mental Health in the Justice System. During his tenure in public office, Cuccinelli was a strong conservative advocate for property rights, lower taxes, less government spending, the Second Amendment, and the pro-life movement. Ken continues to practice law defending Second Amendment rights, as well as championing the disadvantaged. Ken likes to read, shoot skeet, and spend time with his family. Ken and his wife, Tiro, still live in Northern Virginia, and they're the proud parents of seven wonderful children, one son-in-law, and two grandchildren. Ken and Tiro are also parishioners at All Saints Catholic Church in Manassas, Virginia. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Ken Cuccinelli. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Avery, and uh, good morning. It's great to be with you all, um, sort of behind the political lines here in Arlington. Uh, Matt put it pretty gently when he said traditionally liberal Arlington. Um, I think Arlington takes it a little past traditionally liberal myself, but, um, uh, but not all the way to Portland and Seattle where they're burning the place down. So that's good. Um, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the Virginia election, uh, something I know a little bit about. We'll start with the good news. Of course, we won. So uh, that's good news. Um, and um, I, I'm particularly appreciative of that. Uh, in, in Glenn's case, uh, Glenn beat Terry McAuliffe, who is who I lost to in 2013 by uh, two and a half points. And I have to say, it, it's a common thing today on each side to view the other as the spawn of Satan or some equivalent. Um, I don't view the other side that way on an individual basis. Um, my mentor in the General Assembly was a Democrat, Johnny Joannou. Um, and, uh, you know, there, I've had plenty of good relations, and I hope all of you have, with people left of center. Um, however, there are just bad people. And Terry McAuliffe, and I take no joy in saying this, is not a good person. And... Um, Virginia, as I told people in 2013, losing was great for the Cuccinellis, not so good for the Commonwealth. Uh, but that didn't happen a second time. Uh, this time, Glenn beat him by two and a half points, and Virginia will not be subjected uh, to that quality of an individual uh, for the next four years. Instead, we get a good person who uh, is a Christian and a successful businessman, and, uh, and that that goes a long way uh, and is a very important element of the leadership of the Commonwealth. When I'm talking to people about offices and candidates, uh, I consistently and for many years have always told them that the first two things you need to look for in a person are character and judgment. It's not R and D, it's character and judgment. And the COVID experience should have demonstrated to us why that's so important. As we saw very wild-eyed decision-making, uh, not well-based, very poor judgment exercised, in an area that nobody campaigned on. Nobody ran for office before 2019 saying, if we have a pandemic, this is what I'm going to do. What you got was what you already had. And we saw, including right here in Virginia, a lot of bad judgment. A lot of bad judgment. And it is the states and localities, depending on the state, that make public health policy decisions that actually affect people's lives, that affect the economy. It isn't the federal government. It shouldn't be the federal government. It's one of the reasons that the Biden administration is losing things like their OSHA regulation, which by, I can tell you as someone who really enjoyed suing the federal government, um, didn't enjoy being sued so much when I was in the federal government, 
um, that case is a layup. Um, it's a layup. Um, I mean, a, a, a drunk first-year law student could win that case. Um, and, uh, and not that I'm suggesting that's the appropriate route, but, uh, but that it is that level. Um, part of the reason is that some states are pushing back. Now Virginia will be one of those states, again, as it was when I was Attorney General. Of course, Jason Miares won, Winsome Sears won. Um, we had the whole ticket win. And so I'm going to start with that in terms of the Virginia analysis. Um, some of you are too young, many of you are not, to remember back when Virginia was a ticket-splitting state. That doesn't mean it was automatic or sought, but it was common. And I would put the turning point at uh, Barack Obama's presidency. Um, before that, there was significant ticket splitting in Virginia, meaning lots of people would come to the polls and vote for the person, regardless of party. Very common. And so you get outcomes like in 2001, where Jerry Kilgore got the highest percentage anyone ever got running for attorney general. He got 60%. While the two Democrats running, Mark Warner and Tim Kaine, also won for governor and lieutenant governor. I do not see that happening again in the foreseeable future. I don't see that kind of ticket splitting mentality. Um, Virginia, along with America, has polarized and elections like we just had are far more going to be about convincing a much smaller set of swing voters and getting out your team. And that's the, the second of those is more important than the first. Finding and motivating and getting out your team. And that was done this time. And it was done under uh, relatively, by governor's race standards, a new set of election laws. And I'm going to touch on those at the end. But realize that it's not a coincidence that Glenn, Winsome, and Jason all won by roughly 2%. You do get some variation. It's not, it's not a perfect outcome in terms of everybody getting the same percentages. You also get votes drop off. So there are less votes for lieutenant governor and attorney general than there are for governor. Glenn obviously won the nomination back in May. I personally think it's good to have it a little bit earlier like that to give him more time as the nominee. And Jason um, and Winsome, they all had very competitive nominations very competitive nominations. Um, I think the smallest field was four, and that was attorney general, if I remember correctly. So very competitive nominations in a state with no limits on fundraising, which makes the, uh, the federal difference of raising money for the primary and then raising money for the general doesn't really exist in Virginia. It's, it's really just pedal to the metal from the beginning to the end. Um, on the fundraising side. And Glenn brought um, the ability to supplement his fundraising to a degree that he was not going to get out spent. And in a state with no limits on fundraising, Terry McAuliffe's single greatest ability, I'll call it an ability, is fundraising. Um, when I ran against him, I was outspent by $15 million, about 39 to 24. I raised about the same amount, incredibly close, in fact, uh, to the amount Bob McDonnell had raised four years before me. And he had three times the help from the RNC that year than I had in 2013. But McAuliffe's side had $39 million, 11 of which was from Tom Steyer, Steyer the liar. Um, and that was largely motivated uh, by uh, my efforts dealing with Michael Mann. If you remember Climate Gate, he was a UVA professor when he pulled those shenanigans. And um, our efforts to just determine what happened uh, motivated Mr. Steyer to the tune of $11 million. And uh, Michael Bloomberg put $2 million in, 
uh, at the end uh, to run anti-gun ads. Um, and without those two, it's almost even money-wise. Glenn completely neutralized that possibility because, as I'm sure you all know, before he ever ran for office, he was very successful with the Carlisle Group and put himself in a personal position to be able to supplement his fundraising such that he just was not going to get outspent. And this is not a one-on-one -on -one contest. It's two-on-one. -on -one. It's the Democrat and the media versus the Republican. I know I don't have to explain that to you, but it is very, very real. And in terms of the volume of communication that, really, that reaches people, that is a very important thing to keep in mind. This is not just, we measure dollars versus the other side, but remember they get free help from what uh, some people call the mainstream media. I don't find a whole lot mainstream about it. Um, nonetheless, that is, the, that is the layout and how it plays out. And we're sitting here in the most expensive media market in Virginia. And just to give you an example, if you want to buy TV here, a broadcast television, and you say buy NBC because it's the biggest news uh, watched in Northern Virginia, buying those ads, 44% of the people who see them are in Virginia. But you're doing well with the D.C. and Maryland vote and a little bit of West Virginia. But um, so that g gives you an idea. This is a very difficult market. It's very difficult for us on the voting front, as much as Matt and I might joke about Arlington. Frankly, Fairfax today um, is getting awfully close to what Arlington was 20 years ago. And um, not a good trend. And that Northern Virginia voting block Glenn and the, thus the whole ticket made sufficient inroads, didn't win it, made sufficient inroads to allow margins in other parts of the state to carry the ticket. The, the biggest overperformance was in southeast Virginia, was in the Hampton Roads area. Um, turnout was up literally everywhere. I know of not a single jurisdiction in Virginia where turnout was not up fairly substantially over historical norms. This was the highest voter turnout uh, governor's race maybe ever. It was really on the order of a well-contested U.S. Senate midterm race. It was that kind of turnout. Um, in 2017, at that time, the highest turnout that certainly I ever knew of, that was 47% turnout. This year blew it away, absolutely blew it away. Um, I want to say it was over 60% turnout. And um, there could be a lot of reasons for that. One of them may be the early voting, 45 days, very arduous, um, very difficult. I'm going to talk about election security at the end. Um, but the ticket benefited from some things. One, Loudoun County was the national epicenter, and still is, of the parental control CRT debate. And the parental control piece only came in because of the sexual assaults that they weren't telling people about, were denying existed, and were denying um, information to parents over, which surfaced while the whole CRT debate was going on. And this was not a political circumstance in the usual sense. It was an organic reaction in that community to what they were learning with good leadership. We're at the Leadership Institute. Uh, Ian Pryor, among many others out there, has done a spectacular job of leading and organizing that effort as it grew. He didn't create it, he was one of the people upset by what was going on at their school board. And he responded is what he did. But he responded with some skills and ability that really allowed the other parents who felt the same way to be much more impactful. So that was going on in the context of this election. 
and I would call it a, a cultural issue because of the elements. This wasn't, you know, gee, should we have SOLs and, you know, going back to the Allen campaign in 93 and what should they look like, that kind of thing. Um, this, was a, this was about what our t kids are learning, what they're exposed to, how they're taught, um, how the system views them, and more importantly, views their parents and treats their parents. I would characterize that as a cultural fight. And to Glenn's credit, for someone who had never run for office before, he did not shy away from that fight. He embraced it. And that was a critical element of the success of the ticket. Critical element. And it was one of those things that he talked about everywhere he went, whether he was in Loudoun or whether he was in Lee County, you know, regardless, or the third corner of the state, Hampton Roads, um, get our triangle complete. And so that was, a, that was a key and central issue. And I'm sure many of you saw the exit polling. Um, look. People have feelings about issues. That's nice. But what moves people? What makes them, A, show up to vote, or B, if they're going to show up to vote, decide their vote? And the exit polling on education showed that people who came to vote because of education, so it decided their vote, broke 71-28 for Glenn. The, th that's an unheard of split. Unheard of. I remember in the, um, in the Kilgore campaign in 2005, um, they opened with an ad in Northern Virginia, and some of you will remember this, on the death penalty. Tim Kaine is against the death penalty. And um, Jerry Kilgore went after him for it. Okay, difference of opinion, get it. But is that really how you want to introduce yourself? And I called Ken Hutchison, who was the campaign manager then, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, it polls 75-25. Yes, but no one is pro-death. <laughs> This is not going to move people into your column. There is an art and a science to politics, and all they were doing was looking at their numbers, the science. No sense of the art of it. They hadn't talked, to, at the time, I was a second term state senator, the, certainly the leader of the conservative movement, grassroots part of it, in Northern Virginia, and I didn't even know this was coming. They never asked me. And it's not like I disagree with them. I'm not a big death penalty enthusiast. But, but uh, at the same time, um, they started out in a way that wasn't going, it, it really got them off on a bad foot. Started off very poorly. The numbers there were even bigger than the CRT numbers I told you about. 75-25 to take Ken at his word. I'm, believe him. But they didn't move any votes. Education in this election moved votes. Moved votes. Now, I will say, Terry was a little helpful in this space. <laughs> I called Glenn after the debate and I said, my God, I wish he'd been this honest when he was running against me. <laughs> and, um, and of course, he doubled and tripled down. And um, it, which I think is a sort of a feature of the Democrat Party today. They, they, their orthodoxy has moved so far left um, that he actually at least has to say he believes this stuff. That's how he views it. I don't really think Terry believes much of anything other than that Terry should win at whatever Terry is doing. But, um, but that's where he thought he needed to be, and that was his commitment, and he doubled and tripled down, and you saw other voices of the Democrat Party around the country echoing his position. You know, how dare these parents be trying to butt in on how we are teaching these children? And I would urge all of you 
to read, it's only six pages long, uh, Duck, Duck, Go, the Humanist Manifesto. I don't say Google it anymore. Um, pull it up, read it. It's from 1933. It is the game plan of the left. If you didn't know it was written in 1933, you'd read it and think you were reading a report on maybe the last 80 or 90 years. Instead, you're reading the plan. And look at the education piece of it, or understand how it affects education. Um, they have executed on that plan, and they believe in indoctrination. And unfortunately, the, the Stalinist wing of the Democrat Party has become very substantial and very powerful. And I kid you not, on the day we're going to have the Dobbs case heard, um, I believe that there are plenty of people, elected officials, who would put everyone in this room to death if they could get away with it. And their argument would be is society is better off, um, so it's important that we be killed and eliminated. This is the Bolshevik, Menshevik type of argument. And um, when I was Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security dealing with the riots across the country, I used to joke about Ted Wheeler, who's the mayor of Portland, and um, lots of things you can joke about there, but, but uh, that he was, the, he was a Menshevik. And if you don't remember your history, the Mensheviks were, the easier way to think of it is socialist. Um, they and the Bolsheviks took over Russia 100 years ago. And the Bolsheviks uh, were the minority, but much more vicious and violent and killed them all off. Much like the French Revolution, similar occurrence. Well, this is a guy who would go out and talk to the crowds as if they were his friends. And... They hated him, too. And he had no idea. They <laughs> declared a riot. That was very amusing, because um, they were very resistant to saying anything was a riot. Um, but that's the mentality. That's the mentality. And the division that Glenn and Winsome and Jason faced off against is that kind of a chasm. It has really become a much bigger difference left to right and Virginia exemplified that this year. Um, much as 93 Virginia performance foretold 94, contract with America, and in 09 our sweep, and 2010 the Tea Party, Virginia doesn't make those things happen. But we are the first sort of test point in the new political environment with a new president. Next year, as Virginia showed this year, is going to be a very good year for Republicans all across the country. And you all saw that the NRCC added the 10th district, uh, Frank Wolf's old district, now Wexton in Northern Virginia, as a target district along with the 7th, um, Dave Bratt's old district, and the 2nd in Southeast Virginia. We will see where the lines fall. That's going to affect the winnability of those races. But depending how big the wave is, um, we could have more than just those three races be competitive next year in Virginia. And the win by uh, Glenn and Winsome and Jason has really brought more attention and will bring more support to those elections as well. So as challenging as things are for us statewide, um, we, have some, we have some real winning opportunities next year. And... Um, also, while our, the existing Republicans in Congress uh, are probably pretty safe in their districts, uh, even, and will probably get safer with the line moves, um, though we'll see about the fifth. When you draw a tall, thin district, um, it, it's subject to a little more um, concern <laughs> in the next line drawing. Than, uh, than a compact district like, say, the second in Southeast Virginia. And having Glenn in the governor's office is going to be a big deal in those races. It just is. It's very helpful to have the state leadership. It's very helpful to have the electoral boards, um, or at least the state board of elections, under Republican control. All of that comes with Glenn's win. All that comes with Glenn's win. He, he, spoke a great deal in the nomination phase in particular about election security. Um, all the candidates really have to address that in Republican primaries. And, um, and now he's positioned to
take some steps. But let's keep in mind the limitations. We won the House of Delegates, which was outstanding, but it's only 5248. It's only 5248. And the Senate is still 2119 the other way. Um, even with all 19 Republicans sticking together, you still need a Democrat to come over to allow Winsome Sears the opportunity to break the tie. Um, there were a lot of, uh, she and I talked yesterday morning, there were a lot of ties in the last term. There were an unusual number, like 50 votes. Now, a legislator will vote 3,000 times in a session, but lieutenant governor only votes in ties, and obviously that's not that common. Um, but we will see uh, what the Republicans in the House and what Governor Youngkin at that time will be able to do to uh, garner some Democrat support. But at the same time, and you don't, people have known me a long time, no, you don't hear this from me much, we are also going to have to temper our expectations given the Democrat Senate. Um, we did not win some super majority here in Virginia that can roll an agenda through with ease. That is not the situation we're dealing with. However, as Tommy Norman would tell you, the major minority leader in the Senate, the single most important factor for winning the Virginia Senate in 2023, single most important factor, is winning the governor's office in 2021. And Glenn did that. Glenn did that. Um, the governor in those state elections, even far more than the congressional, is the lead fundraising um, driver in those races, in those elections, historically, um, brings an enormous amount of political capital into those races relative to what state senators are able to bring themselves. And um, so Glenn's win is very important and his continued political engagement is going to bear genuine fruit, I'm confident, in 2023 in the Virginia Senate races. Uh, so we have a, then, you know, we might have a different discussion about what's possible if the whole Republican caucus can stick together in both of those bodies. And of course, if the Republicans can hold the House, which they're probably going to have to do twice, they will probably have to run again next year. Uh, 40 years ago, when we had lines drawn after 81, they, the courts made them run again in 82 and again in 83. So we have that to look forward to. Um, though I will say, uh, next year is likely to be good year for Republicans in Virginia again, um, as will, I think, 2023. And this is a lot of the blowback on the Biden administration. Um, uh, I certainly know Jason Miares, who I've talked to a great deal, uh, is very prepared and motivated to join the efforts to check the overreach by this very radical administration. I mean, I thought Obama was radical. But some of the people that Joe Biden is bringing in there just make your head spin. And, um, you know, here we are at the end of 2021. They've just been in long enough now that you'll start seeing significant amounts of regulations roll out. And the governor and the attorney general have significant roles to play in checking that. And like I said, Virginia can rejoin that effort again um, under Glenn's leadership and Jason's um, leadership in the attorney general's office. So I'm, I'm very hopeful in that regard. Uh, amazing cultural fight on the education issue. Um, really, the economy was another traditional one, and Glenn's business experience and acumen really came into play. And one thing Terry had in this election he didn't have when I ran against him is a record. And it was amusing to me, I can say it now the election's over, that I don't want to overstate this, and I, I, my intent is not to slight the Youngkin campaign at all, but they didn't give Terry anything to shoot at that they didn't have to. Whereas, so he didn't have a record. Glenn did not have a record. He hadn't been elected before. He sold it as a positive, new, fresh change, and that was effective. 
Terry did the same thing in 2013, and it was very amusing to hear Terry complaining about his 130 pages of white papers while Glenn wouldn't put anything up. Uh, I truly just would laugh out loud because uh, it was role reversal between Terry and I in 2013 where they just tried to hide. He pulled a Joe Biden. I mean, he literally tried to do as few appearances in the fall as he could and so forth and just attack with the money advantage. And it worked for them. It worked. But it was role reversal this time. And his record, his economic record as a governor, was not good. S governor's performance properly measured is best measured against the states in their area, their region. And all of the states around us did better than we did while he was governor. Um, in job growth, in income growth, all of the things that matter to people's lives, Virginia was beaten. And Glenn learned those numbers. He knew what they were. He beat Terry, Terry about the ears with them. Terry would, even, even politicos, fact checkers, like started rolling their eyes at how Terry would lie about, you know, we had the greatest this and the greatest that. And, um, and he was fact checked to death on that stuff because his performance was very poor, just in objective measures. The economy never goes away as a, as a leading issue. And it never goes away because ultimately what matters to people is what matters in their own life. Cultural issues that don't affect them don't move many votes. This year's cultural issue moved a lot of votes. It moved a lot of votes. And that only happened because the leader of the ticket was willing to seize it with both hands um, and grab onto it and join the side of parents um, to control their children's education, including in the public school arena. The third major issue, by the way, was crime. And this really, crime and criminal justice, this really hadn't sort of faded away as an issue over a number of years. Uh, it was a big issue in George Allen's campaign in 93. A lot of change. That was kind of how I came into Virginia statewide politics and did juvenile justice work and other things with uh, George's appointments. And, and um, it's, we went through a phase both in Virginia and in the country where um, there was a lot more cooperation on this subject coming into the 2000s and 2010s. And you saw one of President Trump's uh, bipartisan accomplishments. One of the biggest was the criminal justice reform effort. And it was something I worked very hard on before I was in the administration and appreciated his willingness to support and advance. Um, but the attitude of the Democrats in vilifying police and of raising criminals up over victims uh, that has taken hold and really, again, come from the same Stalinist left wing of their party that has made this a part of the orthodoxy. It's like the open borders stuff at the national level. But in the state, Jason Miares, Winsome Sears, Glenn Youngkin, they can all point to specific examples in Virginia of how this had failed and cost people in their lives here in Virginia, including cost people their lives in Virginia. And um, whatever they may have had in mind, McAuliffe and Northam over the last eight years, and Herring, I called him Red Herring. Red Herring's gone now. But um, uh, they uh, shared this antipathy toward law enforcement. It is no accident that Democrat sheriffs were endorsing Glenn Youngkin for governor. Glenn went and sought their support. He asked for their support. He told them why it was a good idea from a law enforcement perspective. And look, you talk to law enforcement people, for those of you who haven't engaged in this arena, um, uh, overwhelmingly good folks. Of course, you occasionally have your bad apples. But they care first about law enforcement. You go talk to a rural sheriff, he doesn't care about R's and D's as much as he does doing the job of a sheriff. And um, Glenn took full advantage of that. I don't say that in a, in a negative way. I say it in a positive way. 
He let them know, I am on your side. And you're going to have a governor now who will actually support law enforcement. Our own state capital suffered from the riots and the burnings and so forth that happened in other parts of the country. And when mayors like LeVar Stoney won't do anything because they're siding with the criminals over the people who live there, the governor is supposed to step in, first with state police, and then, if you need to, with National Guard. Well, Northam wouldn't do that because he was not on the people's side. He was on the criminal's side. And law enforcement all across Virginia now knows they have a governor who will back them up in Glen Youngkin. It makes an enormous difference in how policing actually happens. Some of you may have heard of what was called at the time um, the Ferguson effect. And the Ferguson effect is the notion that police, who are the only people in this country, domestically, that we ask to put a gun on when they go to work with the possibility of using it, are the only ones standing between us and evil. And that evil exists in every community. And that is a tough situation, can call for split-second decision-making that isn't always correct. And if you're a police officer and you believe that if you make a mistake, they're going to hang you out to dry, you're not going to put yourself in a position to make a mistake, which also means you're not going to put yourself in a position to protect people who need it. Well, now in Virginia... We have a governor coming in who's made it very clear he will stand behind those law enforcement officers. He will back them up with state police or National Guard if the need arises. That is a big, big difference in Virginia in the next four years. And I, I only wish, looking ahead, that they could get more credit for it than they're going to, uh, Glenn in particular. But you don't get a lot of public credit for things that don't happen. And the benefit on this front of Glenn Youngkin as governor is a lot of things aren't going to happen that might otherwise happen in the riot and looting front. And they won't happen because part of the reason they happen in the first place is the belief that people can get away with it. Punishments don't matter. Likelihood of getting caught matters. In, dis in decisions about criminal behavior. And the election of Glenn Youngkin changes that equation. It changes that equation. So we have that to look forward to come this January. I want to close with just a comment on election security. Virginia, we won with a Democrat set of rules. They made over 60 changes in the last two years to Virginia election laws. And there's a few lessons here. One, we can win under any set of rules. The rules don't determine the winner. And that's really important to remember. And it's a lesson, not just all of these lessons aren't just for Virginia. These are lessons for the whole country that Virginia is showing. The second is Virginians, including people in this room, who saw what a mess 2020 was, whether it was in your community or in another part of the country, and responded to it by stepping forward and saying, not only should somebody do something about this, but I'm going to do something about this. This is the election version of parents stepping forward in the educational arena. And literally thousands of Virginians work together to create new organizations to take advantage of ones that already exist, for instance, the Virginia Institute for Public Policy, run by Lynn Taylor, organized, trained themselves, taught themselves, recruited others to be election officials, not poll watchers, I'll get to that, but election officials. Go get appointed by your local GOP chairman or offered up, the electoral board locally appoints. We have been outnumbered in this state by Democrats two to one inside the polling places for years. 
for years. We made more headway. We have not caught them, by the way. But we made more headway in evening that up inside the polling place this year than ever before. And the credit goes to an enormous number of ordinary Virginians. The Republican Party didn't do this. National organizations didn't do this. Ordinary Virginians stepped up to help solve this problem. Uh, during this year, the RNC for the first time decided they're going to keep a permanent election integrity division up and running. I won't go into why that didn't exist before, but that is a very good thing nationally. Uh, I think we need to replicate that in Virginia as opposed to recreating it every year. Well, and Chris Marston is always the one who, re it's the same guy recreating it, so he knows what to do. But there isn't a permanent arrangement in place, and this hasn't been prioritized enough. But it was prioritized enough this year to have elections that were clean enough to not have to worry about them affecting the outcome. There were problems like Fairfax breaking the law on accepting absentee ballot applications. I hope Jason Miares will prosecute that. That is a prosecutable offense, and the Attorney General's office uh, has jurisdiction over that. It isn't just Commonwealth's attorneys. Um, accountability is important. One of the biggest problems we saw in 2020 wasn't bad laws. It was state officials who didn't follow their own laws. They just openly broke the law. And uh, if you don't have accountability for that, it continues. Again, remember, it isn't the punishment. It's the likelihood of getting caught and being held accountable. Um, what Virginia did is duplicatable all over the country on the election security and transparency front really is. And um, we're learning a lot of lessons. All of us who were engaged in these conversations are gathering them up and continuing to do that, um, to share with the rest of the country. And that is a very valuable uh, sort of parallel to the election. The campaigns weren't running this. Um, this went on in parallel and benefited them tremendously. And we're very fortunate for all of those folks who participated in that effort. Um, and like I said, it's very basic stuff. This is the blocking and tackling. Blocking and tackling is taught here at Leadership Institute. They've done it for years effectively. And I might just say that if Morton was going to break an arm, I'm glad it wasn't his right wing. It was his left. Um, I'd rather he didn't break either. But, but um, uh, that parallel occurrence in the election was very successful. Very, very successful. And there's a lot for people to be proud of there. I'm looking forward to Governor-elect Youngkin being Governor Youngkin, having the tie-breaking vote in the Senate held by Winsome Sears, a real wallflower, and, um, <laughs> and having the Attorney General's office again in the hands of someone who's committed to actually upholding the Constitution instead of ignoring it. And uh, we're in a very good place in Virginia. I will point out, um, for the long-term future, the circumstances could, political circumstances could have hardly been better for us. And we had a candidate at the top of the ticket who, as I said, could apply his own money to not being outspent. I mean, everything went our way. And we only won by two and a half points. So... We, we've really got to prove, and this is on Glenn and Winsome and Jason, prove the value of Republican leadership again by performance to be able to sustain the opportunity to win in the future. Um, it's, a, it's a sobering thought. Um, when, when, when I was on a, a, the sweep in 2009, the first year of Obama, which I would compare to the first year of Biden, um, we were getting Bob got 59, I got 58, Bill got 57% of the vote. That's a big difference. That's a big difference, and that's the move of Virginia, um, largely driven by the nation's capital and the federal spending, um, but uh, be that as it may. So I'm longer than I intended to. I'm happy to take a couple of questions if you want me to, and I will be short on those. Yes, sir? Say it. I'll repeat it for the mic. Oh, you have a mic? 
I see movement like there's my, okay, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, I'll repeat it. So, um, you know, personnel is policy, and uh, who gets picked for various positions? You know, director of public health, nobody thought much about four years ago. <laughs> Think about it now. Um, and, uh, you know, secretary of education, those positions are going to have a, a great deal of impact on how the next four years goes in terms of politics and policy. Uh, for those who have the, you know, the experience to participate, one, and whether it's this crowd or others, those people need to step forward. Um, the pay you get in state government will not, you know, is not to write home to mom about kind of a thing. It is service, because you're, you're taking a hit in that regard. But there's a real opportunity here to make a lot of people's lives better. So the first step is the personnel choices um, and advocating for people who are going to pursue the policies you feel strongly about. Um, but the most important thing is the election. I mean, lobbying people to do things is much harder than electing people who are already committed. And we've done that part. We've done that part. And you all, I know everybody here played a role in that. Um, so I, I think the best you can do, again, recognizing there's a Democrat Senate and a bare majority of Republicans in the House, um, is uh, we do need to have somewhat tempered expectations, but uh, hold all these candidates, including the House candidates who ran and won, uh, to what they said they were going to do, to at least trying to do that, and holding up a mirror to them. People are not uh, comfortable failing their own standard of measure. They really aren't. People say, oh, politicians, blasé, just they said it together. People are very uncomfortable. One of the admirable things about working for Donald Trump is the strongest argument you could make in a White House debate was this is what you said on the campaign trail. And um, that's very much to his credit. And I'm hoping that in that respect, Glenn will be very similar. And uh, I have no reason to think he won't be. Um, and, uh, you know, he did make, he laid out his vision, and I think uh, pointing that out to him at any point in time and to members of the House who will first have to pass it uh, is the appropriate next step. But, you know, we've, d we've done the most important thing, and that's elect a good person who laid out an agenda that we can all get behind. Sure. So, um, two very different questions. First of all, uh, particularly in the COVID era, um, the impositions by government on religious schools have been very significant. And um, I'm hopeful that Glenn is just going to remove them. 
and let those schools make their own decisions uh, in concert with the parents of the children in those schools. Um, as it relates to public schools, you, you, you really don't, faith isn't injected there. That's left to parents. Um, the key is that it be left to parents as opposed to having schools uh, take a role because they're not going to be, this is not schools 50 years ago. They are atheistic. I mean, I told you to read that humanist manifesto. Secular humanism is atheistic. And, uh, and that is definitely where they have taken the schools. And uh, so we, we really don't want public schools weighing in on matters of faith, nor getting in the way of parents imposing, teaching uh, those directions to their children. The school's role is to support that. And actually the Virginia Code in Title I says parents are the ones who under Virginia law uh, have control of their children's upbringing. And uh, it's, it's an aspirational code section. Nonetheless, uh, it's important. And a lot of our school boards seem to have forgotten it. Um, and again, it was central to Glenn's race, and he seized on that. Um, with respect to your social media question, um, no question social media is playing a major role in the polarization. They actively attempt to polarize. That is part of their business model. Um, there's, there are documentaries out there now about people who started many of these companies who won't let their children anywhere near it. And they'll describe for you what's going on. They're literally trying to find ways to ping you, to e not irritate you in an angry sense per se, though they don't mind making you angry. It's to irritate you to act, to interact with their product. And they find that the most effective way to do that uh, also, not coincidentally, ends up in great polarization. So it's literally designed into their products now, and uh, th that isn't going to change until some outside force comes in and, and really fights it. And it's one of those areas, by the way, that there could be left-right cooperation in breaking down some of these companies and just their massive um, uh, influence that they have in society today. You want to tell me how many more? Okay. Yes, sir. Let's go with the young one. Yep. My pleasure. As a local first responder, um, some of us are suffering from local vaccine mandates. Yep. So, first of all, thank you for your work, and um, it's amazing how it's, it's amazing how people who a year ago were hailed as heroes are now um, being castigated by the same folks um, who wanted their picture taken with them last year, and uh, that probably puts it at about the le depth of of meaning last year, and um, uh, I, I I do have very strong feelings about this and and um, believe that the, uh, first of all, the federal government has no role in making these decisions. Um, these are what are called police powers. That doesn't mean cop, deputy, police. That means uh, police power in a constitutional sense are things like public health, zoning, local, uh, local uh, response mechanisms. Those have always been the control of the state and they're part of the constitutional structure as such. It's part of how the federal government is restrained constitutionally is by not having those powers. So if you think through the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, the federal government, we did a lot of things. We were responsible for travel in and out of the country and domestically, but decisions about what was going to happen in your community were made by state and local governments, and it's supposed to be that way. As the governor, Glenn has an awful lot of influence over what those decisions are. Not absolute control, but there's no question that if they put their mind to it in the next administration, they could undo those mandates, both in schools, uh, for say masking of children, for now, some of them will gladly jump into vaccine mandates if they can, um, and um, 
and also for the economy more generally and for, for government employees. And of course, in the, in the first responder arena, you also have volunteer companies of firefighters who, can, who actually make their own decisions um, unless they're constrained by government funding, which is the string that government often pulls, usually pulls. What we all call mandates, for instance, at the federal level aren't actually mandates. There are virtually no federal mandates. What there are is federal spending that come with all the strings attached. And it's just no one even considers not taking the funding, um, though we should. And when the federal government goes bankrupt, we'll all have that opportunity <laughs> in spades. Um, but uh, as a simple matter of freedom versus the seriousness, you know, this is not some uh, asymptomatic form of Ebola running around. We, we know, especially for children, it is less dangerous than the flu. Um, and uh, for children, I, honestly, I, I was one of the first members of the coronavirus task force appointed by President Trump. And if we knew then what we knew today, we'd probably have had chicken pox parties um, over this. And the Omicron variant, I'm watching it very closely, may actually be the mildest version yet. We may all want to go get the Omicron variant. Um, and I'm, you laugh, but I'm not kidding. Um, now, there are people who shouldn't do that, but for people who don't have secondary health conditions, that may be the thing for us to do. Um, and you do that by your choice. And, and there we get to the heart of it, right? Is your liberty, your individual liberty, one of the distinguishing features of the United States of America um, being imposed on just to do your job. And, and I've seen judges say, um, you're not being compelled you don't have to do this job. And I would invite your attention to Federalist Number 79, in which Alexander Hamilton said that the power over, uh, I won't get it exactly right, the power over your subs, a man's substance is a power over his will. Um, and he was talking there about judges' salaries and the ability of lowering them or blocking the ability to lower them. But the principle is absolutely correct. We need our jobs to survive and feed our families. This is not some, you know, hobby at, at foundation. When we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of happiness, the foundation in, in the real world is work. It's work. It's the ability to be employed and the freedom to be employed. And on a technical basis, the government can make some impositions, but this goes way, way, way too far. And I am very hopeful that incoming Governor Youngkin will be very aggressive, because um, there are degrees of aggressiveness he can undertake here, in blocking these sorts of mandates on first responders, among others, really all government employees, including in the public health space. Well, you know, the first question we got, what are things that we can do now? Letting his whole transition team know that. You know, this isn't something you can start contemplating on day one. It's something you already got to know what you're going to do on day one. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So, um, again, thank you for your service. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely an area where I believe there are moral elements at play. It is just morally wrong to put the kind of demands on first responders we do while then imposing uh, the kind of burdens that the current governor would like to impose and president as well. So I hope that part of what we elected was protection from that in Governor-elect Youngkin and the Attorney General will play a role in that as well with Jason Miares. So thank you all very much. I know I went long here, but I hope it was useful. Yeah, absolutely.